الشعاري Good afternoon, you're watching the English newscast on Future Television. I'm Lina Zemin and these are today's top stories. Four people are killed in a car bomb near a Shiite mosque in Saudi Arabia's Dammam, an attack claimed by ISIS. Calm prevails in Arsal as the army deployed heavily in the rest of town, stepping up security measures. And residents of Abuja and Lagos celebrate the first ever democratic transfer of power in Nigeria as former military ruler Muhammadu Buhari is inaugurated as president. ISIS has reportedly claimed the attack on a Shiite mosque in Saudi Arabia's Dammam via Twitter. Four people were killed when a car exploded near the mosque. A witness identified only as Ahmed told Reuters he was with his family near the mosque when a quick explosion happened. He said acquaintances at the mosque told him an attendant was killed along with a bomber when he tried to prevent him from reaching it. The bombing comes a week after a suicide bomber detonated his explosives at a Shia mosque in the Gulf Kingdom's Khatif province during Friday prayers, killing at least seven people and wounding several others. Several youth from the northeastern border town of Asal allegedly headed to its outskirts to join jihadists, despite the heavy deployment of the Lebanese army in the village. Sources presume that they aim at participating in any confrontation with Hezbollah in the area. Meanwhile, a prominent security source said the army was present and ready to confront terrorists in Arsal. The source noted that Arsal will not be a safe haven for terrorists and will not allow any side to partake in preserving Lebanon's sovereignty. Calm prevails in Arsal, however, after the army deployed heavily in the rest of town yesterday, stepping up its security measures, a move that was welcomed by anxious residents. Troops erected checkpoints inside the town and at the entrances of Syrian refugee equip encampments and staged mechanized patrols. The deployment comes after Hezbollah chief Said Hassan Nasrallah on Sunday hinted that his group will try to eliminate the militants of the ISIS and Nusra from Arsal's outskirts if the Lebanese state fails to do so. Prime Minister Tamam Slam has received a delegation of families of the Arsal captives at the Grand Sarai. The meeting was also attended by MP Jamal Jarrah and Secretary General of the Higher Relief Committee, General Mohamed Khair. Jarrah said they visited Salam to express Arsal's support for the Lebanese state, its army and institutions. Parliament Speaker Nabih Biri has received the advisor of the Islamic Supreme Leader in Iran, Sheikh Mohammad Hassan Akhtari, and the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon, Hamad Fatali. The talks in Ayn Atine touched on the latest developments in Lebanon and the region. Biri and Akhtari exchanged views on the need to consolidate Islamic unity and confront terrorism and takfirism. Later, Biri also received U.S. Ambassador to Lebanon, Mr. David Hill, and media advisor Ali Hamdan. Talks also focused on the situation in Lebanon and the region. A Syrian insurgent alliance, which has captured the last government held town in a north northwestern Idlib province, has made further advances. The army of Fatah, which includes Al Qaeda's Syria wing Nusra Front, the Islamist Ahrar al Sham group, and other factions, captured Ahira town last night as the Syrian military pulled back. The Syrian army has lost large parts of Idlib province to insurgents since last March when the provincial capital fell to the insurgent alliance, whose name is a reference to Islamic conquest. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says the insurgents captured at, captured at least four villages close to Ariha in heavy clashes. The Syrian Air Force also carried out airstrikes on the area. The United Nations' out outgoing humanitarian chief has painted a harrowing portrait of savagery in Syria's civil war now in its fifth year and urged the Security Council to take collective action to put an end to the carnage. The Syrian war has killed more than 220,000 people. Of the country's roughly 23 million people, some 12.2 million are in need of humanitarian aid, including 5 million children. For more than four years, we have watched Syria descend into deeper depths of despair, surpassing what even the most pessimistic observers thought possible. 
In the past weeks, we have seen more and more heinous acts. Innocent men, women and children killed, maimed, displaced and subjected to a savagery that no human should have to endure. The parties to the conflict have ignored practically all aspects of the resolution. The use of chlorine continues to be reported, killing, injuring and terrorizing civilians. Indiscriminate attacks, although prohibited in international humanitarian law, continue with no regard for the protection of civilians. Schools and hospitals continue to be attacked. ISIL's advance brings with it new depths of depravity to Syria with indiscriminate killing and maiming, raping and destroying. They have forcibly recruited children and made the delivery of humanitarian assistance more and more difficult in areas under their control. And coming up next, FIFA President Sepp Blatter is waiting to find out whether he will extend his 17-year leadership of the Socceros World Governing Body stage. Welcome back. Former military ruler Muhammadu Buhari has formally been sworn in as Nigeria's next president after he defeated President Goodluck Jonathan in March 28th elections. Buhari, who was sworn in in the capital city of Abuja as the first Nigerian to oust a sitting president through the ballot box, dressed in traditional Muslim attire, Buhari stood on the stage clutching a Quran in his right hand as he pledged to uphold the constitution and laws of Africa's most populous nation. The 72-year-old takes over as head of Africa's top economy and leading oil producer as it limps back to normalcy after fuel shortages that brought the country to a near standstill. Buhari has already pledged to get tough on the corruption that pervades every aspect of life in the country and has vowed to spare no effort to defeat the Boko Haram armed group, which has killed thousands and displaced more than a million people in a six-year campaign to establish a caliphate in the northeast region abutting Lake Chad. The FIFA presidential election will determine whether Sepp Blatter will extend his 17-year rule as the helm of soccer's world governing body. It comes at the end of a week which has brought shame and humiliation on FIFA, according to Blatter, following the arrest of leading soccer officials at their Zurich hotel. Blatter is standing for a fifth mandate in today's presidential election, where Prince Ali bin al-Hussein is his only challenger, he said in his opening speech to FIFA's annual congress in Zurich. Seven of the most powerful figures in global football were arrested on Wednesday in a dawn raid on a luxury hotel that FIFA used to host visiting officials and face extradition to the United States on corruption charges. The Swiss authorities also announced a criminal investigation into the awarding of the next two World Cups being hosted in Russia in 2018 and Qatar in 2022. U.S. authorities said nine football officials and five sports media and promotions executive fit execu executives face corruption charges involving more than $150 million in bribes. Half a million uh, Awaz members have already signed the petition calling for Sepp Blatter to step down. Uh, if Blatter doesn't go despite giving the World Cup to a country that has slave labor, if Blatter doesn't go despite the fact that his sponsors are starting to wobble, and if Blatter doesn't go despite the fact that half his board has been arrested, uh, uh, it's not just Blatter that needs to be axed, the FIFA Congress itself needs to be questioned. Yes, in my view, he should go. You cannot have accusations of corruption at this level and on this scale in this organization and pretend that the person currently leading it is the right person to take it forward. That cannot be the case. Frankly, what we've seen is the ugly side of the beautiful game, and he should go. And the sooner that happens, the better, the faster that organization can start to rebuild its credibility, which is going to be so important because so many people around the world want to see uh, this game properly managed, properly looked after, so we can all enjoy the World Cups of the future. British Prime Minister David Cameron has kicked off his visit to Berlin with a military honors ceremony at the German Chancellery, where he was received by Chancellor Angela Merkel. Cameron is meeting Merkel in an attempt to gauge how far Berlin will go to keep the UK, the world's fifth largest economy inside the European Union, ahead of a referendum on membership. French President François Hollande told Cameron he wanted Britain to stay in the world's biggest trading bloc, while Cameron said the status quo in Europe was not good enough. Cameron also met his Polish counterpart Eva Kopas, 
this morning, but Warsaw said it will be firm over the rights of Polish migrants in Britain and that it will not countenance treaty change, a key demand for Britain. The UN will release a draft ruling on whether it will add the Great Barrier Reef to its list of World Heritage Sites that are in danger. UNESCO, the UN's educational, scientific and cultural organization, will make a final decision on the move in June as international concern grows over the state of the reef. In 2010, a Chinese coal carrier ran aground in the Great Barrier Reef, provoking an international outcry. Since then, there has been renewed concern that development, particularly coal mining in Australia's northeastern state of Queensland, could endanger the reef. Environmental campaign group Greenpeace has led an international movement rallying to save the Great Barrier Reef by pressuring banks to withhold funding from mining projects that will increase shipping off the Queensland coast. A decision to list the reef as in danger would be an embarrassment for the Australian government, which has recently increased funding for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Australian television will show a special program on Sunday featuring a woman meeting the man who bears her brother's face thanks to a first full-face transplant. Joshua Aversano was hit and killed in a car accident, leaving his sister Rebecca and her family left with the difficult decision of whether to donate his face to save the life of another man, according to the program's 60 Minutes show, shown on Channel 9. The family agreed to it, and Richard Norris was the man who benefited. The program says Norris is the recipient of the, wor the, of the world's first full-face transplant. It shows Aversano meeting Norris for the first time, three years after the transplant took place. Take a look. Rebecca donated her dead brother's face so another man could live. She's about to meet him on 60 Minutes. Do you mind if I touch it? No, not at all. For the first time. Wow. Seeing, touching, feeling her brother's face. This is the face that I grew up with. On another man. 60 Minutes, Sunday, 8.30. And finally, we'll leave you with some extracts of a cartoon created by a Chinese art school student depicting the horrors of society's addiction to mobile phones. Check it out. Mark Stan of Robolton for today. Now for a reminder of our top stories. Four people are killed in a car bomb near a Shiite mosque in Saudi Arabia's Dammam, an attack claimed by ISIS. Calm prevails in Aysal as the army deploys heavily in the rest of town, stepping up security measures. And residents of Abuja and Lagos celebrate the first ever democratic transfer of power in Nigeria. 
as former military ruler Muhammadu Buhari is inaugurated as president. Those are your Friday headlines from us here at Future Television. I'm Linda Zimim, and I'll see you again tomorrow for more updates. Tune in.